בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם we have two פרשות this week, פרשת הזריע, it's actually different in Israel, they're only reading one פרשה, so until the end of the book ויקרא, we're actually going to be in a different order than Israel, we're one behind than Israel, but this פרשה, פרשת הזריע, has so many different things in it, it's, uh, it's really amazing that uh, you could literally learn the most critical things of the Torah to get yourself out of trouble, or get yourself in trouble. This is the parasha that someone is either going to get Olam Ba, if he listens to it, or Chas V'chalila, the other place. A lot of people don't like to talk and don't like to believe that there is a Geinom. And even though learning about the Geinom is not necessarily for everyone, you have to be at a certain spiritual level to learn about it, because when you learn the details of, the ge- of Geinom, it could, and, and how dangerous our life is, and the things that we do and take for granted is, well, we don't think something is a big deal, and in Shamayim it's really a big deal. Mama, someone that's not ready for it can go into a complete depression. What about the Geinom? Because he already thinks that there's no, no hope for me. No hope for me. There's a uh, story about the, uh, the rabbi of, uh, they call him Acher, but he was the rabbi for um, Rabbi Meir Balanes. Mm-hmm. So obviously, Rabbi Meir Balanes is a giant. He's all over the Gemara. Everyone knows, who knows even people that are not religious know who Rabbi Meir Balanes is. His rabbi... Chazar b'she'ela, he fell off, fell off the derech. And Rabbi Meir continued to learn from him. So the students told him, listen, you know, or the other rabbis, listen, you can't learn from, uh, from him, he's a rasha. He's going against the Torah, he goes, no, no, but I know I am already at a level where I can take the good from him and cancel out the bad. Because what the Torah says is that you're not allowed to learn Torah from someone who's a rasha. You can't. You're not allowed to learn. Even if he's a genius, you're not allowed to learn Torah from him. So, but Rabbi Meir was a different level. So one day, Rabbi Meir is uh, walking alongside the rabbi, who's not really a rabbi anymore, but anyway, the point is, he's walking along, and he's on a horse. And he's teaching him Torah. Can, can. He's on a horse. So, it gets to 200 amot, 2,000 amot. 2,000 amot is the mo- most amount that you're allowed to walk on Shabbat before you, uh, you're, uh, what's, you're leaving, in essence, leaving the city. You're not allowed to walk past that. It's, a, it's the uh, border. So he tells, he tells Rabbi Meir, stop. You can't walk any, you can't work past this line. It's Shabbat. He goes, why? You're not a Jew? And he says to him, yeah, but it's too late for me. He goes, no, Hashem said that Hashem created the tshuva before he created the world. It's not too late for you. He goes, yeah, but I, list, I heard a bat kol. I, hold, I, I heard a uh, heavenly voice saying that everyone can do tshuva except him. So even though he really heard that, it wasn't necessarily that. The Gemara explains it is that he made such critical sins, such big sins, it was bad enough. Because he knew so much Torah and he still made those sins, he literally went against Hashem. So Hashem said, you could do tshuva, but I'm not going to help you. What does it mean? Every time someone is living their life, they always are going to get different times of their life. They're going to get an opportunity to do tshuva. Hashem is going to send you a messenger. He's going to send you a messenger. Either you're going to hear a shiur that's really amazing on, uh, on the internet, mm-hmm. or you're going to see a shiur at a, uh, at a, uh, with a rabbi, or, an, or you're going to pick up some book that's going to be amazing. Something is going to happen that could be a life-changing event, and you're going to have a choice to make. I'm either going to continue with this and do tshuva and listen to what Hashem says, or I'm just going to continue my life and make it like it never happened. And this is going to happen regularly throughout somebody's life. Each time that happens, Hashem is giving you an opportunity to come back to Him. And each time He's telling you, I'm going to help you, but each time I'm going to help you less. 
So if somebody does tshuva between the ages of, let's say, 20 and 30, he's going to get 90% help from Hashem. Which is a lot of help. It's, 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 it makes it easy for him to do tshuva. 30 and 40, he's already down to 70% help from Hashem. 40 and 50, he's already down to 50%. Once he's above 50, 60 years old, yeah. maybe you have 30%, 40% help from Hashem, and it becomes very, very difficult for someone to fix their midot, to fix who they are, because they're so used to the honoring the Yetzirah instead of honoring Hashem, it's very difficult for them to do it. They can still do tshuva, but they're not going to get as much help from Hashem, which is the reason why we have to encourage everyone we know as soon as possible to do tshuva, because, and early as possible, because the more time we waste, the more difficult it's going to become. So, with the issues with tshuva, a lot of people say, listen, I'm going to do tshuva, I'm going to start keeping kosher. I'm going to do tshuva, I'm going to start keeping, uh, you know, do tefillin. I'm going to do tshuva, I'm going to start praying uh, once a day. It's good, listen, it's good. Yeah, some, we have to start somewhere. Everyone has to start somewhere. But one thing that we learned from the beginning of this parasha is that it says, So it's telling us that this woman gave birth and on the eighth day, they're going to have a Brit Milah. But we already know this. Now, obviously we know there's not one letter in, in, in the Torah that's wasted. Every letter is counted for. So why is, he remi- why is Hashem reminding us again? Not only, okay, he could have even said, okay, he's get, this woman's going to have a Brit Milah for our son. Why does he have to mention again, Bayom Hashmini? First he's saying Bayom, then he's saying Bashmini. Bayom he's mentioning it, Chazal explains to us, because Brit Milah you're only allowed to do it during the day. But Shmini is mentioning it. You're not allowed it. to do it during the day? Only allowed to do it. Only in the only day. During, during the day. Not allowed to do it at night. Okay. Not allowed to do it at night. But Shmini is mentioning to us, we learned from this, that even on Shabbat, you're allowed to do t- uh, Brit Milah. Even Yom Kippur. You're allowed to do you're Brit right? Milah. Even Yom Kippur, you're allowed to do Brit Milah. Why? Because Brit Milah is, is, is the first mitzvah that someone is supposed to do. Okay. On the eighth day, you're supposed to do, you're supposed to do this is the Connection, this is the Brit, the deal that we have. The but who is doing the mitzvah? The father? The father is the doing the mitzvah. Or the kid? The kid because doesn't have a choice. Thing. The kid doesn't have a choice. So he doesn't do a mitzvah. Ah, but He's doing a mitzvah the later father. on in his life. The father is doing a mitzvah. How do we know this is critical for everyone? The kid, the father, and the moil. How do we know? From the story of Moses. When Hashem sent Moses to... Egypt, after the whole event, we talked to him in the burning bush. He said to Moses, listen, you're going to be the main one. You're going to be the number one person in history. <laughs> they're going to know you, and they're going to know me forever. Mm-hmm. So he's almost not comparing the Avdi ben Moshe to Hashem, but he's saying they're going to know you and me, right. Hashem is saying. So obviously Moshe, number one draft pick. Everyone knows that Moshe is going to be remembered forever. Mm-hmm. He's better than anyone, Okay. Moshe takes his family, he just had a brand new son born, Eliezer, and he starts going towards Egypt. On the way to Egypt, it says, and Hashem comes down to kill Moshe. Hashem comes down, sends a malach to kill Moshe. What do you mean? You just told him a page ago that he's your number one guy. You just said that he, you're, every, the whole world forever is going to remember Moshe forever. Mm-hmm. And now you're going to kill him? It doesn't make any sense. How is he saved? When his wife Tzipora notices that the angel is swallowing Moshe in a way where the only thing that's uncovered is his part that is a, uh, is, uh, is, is, it's but organ, the sex organ. So to know that the Brit Milah, the fact that Moshe decided to delay his son's Brit Milah is a... Isur Karet, not allowed to do it. So you have to do Brit Milah exactly on the eighth day. Moshe said, you know what, maybe we're already on the way, it's dangerous, we're in the middle of the desert, maybe we'll do Brit Milah once we get to Egypt. He wanted to use his own logic. Hashem says, no, your logic doesn't count. Even though Moshe Rabbeinu is the smartest of everyone, 
even though Moshe Rabbeinu knew more than everyone. The reality of it is that he could not, could not, under any condition, make this, uh, make this decision. So we know from there that to make a decision with our own logic doesn't count. We have to listen to what Hashem says. So the Yom Shmini explains to us how Shabbat, how critical Shabbat is for us. Why Shabbat? Because Shabbat, we know, is the foundation of Judaism. And here is one of the opportunities that we learn about Shabbat, because Hashem says, listen, you're not allowed to break Shabbat under any condition, but for Brit Milah you're allowed. Why? Because Brit Milah is also a covenant between me and you. Shabbat is also a covenant between me and you. But the Shabbat can be put on hold, you do the Brit Milah, and then you go back to Shabbat. You're not allowed to drive to Shul because, uh, because it's a Brit Milah. You know, so you do the Brit Milah, and then, and then you go back to Shabbat. That's it. You don't uh, have somebody, a cameraman, on sh- just because of the Milah. So you, you still have to honor the Shabbat. So here's an opportunity for us to remember, when we're talking about Ba'alei Tshuva, some people want to think that I could start with doing tefillin, pray, maybe I'll learn once a week. Chazal explains to us that yes, all of those things are good. You have to learn Torah, you have to do tefillin, you have to pray, you have to give tzedakah, all those things are good. But without Shabbat, there's no such thing as tshuva. No such thing as tshuva. Why? Because without Shabbat, there's no Judaism. This is why Hashem made it the fourth commandment. The first three commandments that He gave us in Mount Sinai, before He gave us the Torah, He gave us ten commandments. First three commandments, know who Hashem is, He's the only God, no idols, don't use His name in vain, and then keep the Shabbat. Before murder. Meaning that if someone said, listen, I have a uh, job. I, you know, I make all my money on Shabbat. What am I going to do? All my meetings, I sell cars, or I sell real estate, or I sell this, or I sell that. I, tell, I don't work six days, I only work on Shabbat. So what does the Torah say? The Torah says, okay, we have a different job for you. We have a different job. Take the gun I'm going to give you and be a sniper. Six days a week. Each I'm going to give you a list of 100 people. 100 people. I don't like them. And on, on each day, kill one of them. Monday, you kill one guy. Tuesday, you kill another guy. Maybe Wednesday is a good day. You kill 15 guys. Thursday, another guy. Friday, another guy. But Shabbat, you don't work. Each one, you get $25,000. It's a good deal, no? Mm-hmm. A lot of money. This is not as bad as violating Shabbat once. Killing all those people is not as bad as violating Shabbat one time. Why? Because Shabbat is the fourth commandment. Shabbat is the connection we have with Hashem. Murder is bad in our own logic, but murder, murder does not deny God. Shabbat is pretty much saying, I agree, I believe, that Hashem is the only creator he created the world from nothing. In six days, there is nothing other than Him. He's in control of everything. If I don't keep Shabbat, I'm pretty much saying that I don't think all of those things. I don't think Hashem is in control. I don't think that Hashem created everything. I don't think anything. I just think that Hashem is just, maybe He's there, maybe He's not. 50-50. So when someone does not keep Shabbat, he's pretty much saying that there's a good chance Hashem doesn't exist. Someone is murdering somebody. He's not saying that. He's just saying, I need the money. Or I don't like that guy. It's completely different things. Hashem specifically told us, Shabbat is above everything else. Other than obviously the first three commandments which are between us and Hashem. It's above honoring the parents. It's above stealing. It's above adultery. It's above everything else. So someone that thinks that their panasah, it's more important than Shabbat, is thinking the wrong way. Why? Because when you realize that Shabbat is so critical, you realize that Parnassah is from Shemaim. Mm-hmm. Parnassah is always going to come from Shemaim. If Hashem wants to give it to you, He can give it to you on any day. He doesn't have to give it to you on Shabbat. As a matter of fact, if you honor the Shabbat, you're giving Him more of a reason to give you. How do we know this? Because we have also Shabbat in years. We have six years we're allowed to work, seventh year we're not allowed to work. You know, as far as the farmers. But Hashem promised... That is someone that keeps this the the uh, Shnat Shmita, 
is not only going to be okay, but they're going to get even more than someone who doesn't keep it on the sixth year. They're always going to get enough for the sixth year, for the seventh year, and even enough for the eighth year. So we know we see this generation after generation working out, and that's why it's very important for us to understand that if someone is going to do tshuva, maybe they can't keep Shabbat right away because it's not in their head yet, but the target has to be that I need to keep Shabbat as soon as possible. All of this learning that I'm doing, is so I learn so enough to keep Shabbat. At, at least by the, by the end of your life, you have to reach a level where you keep Shabbat a little bit. 100%. But well, what's hundred percent? A hundred percent keeping Shabbat? Yeah, because look, there is people who are keeping Shabbat in their mind, hundred percent. No, no. And, uh, and you go to Haradi, he's telling you that's not enough. No, no. So is is the Shabbat? Okay, let me let me let's explain. Let's explain. Let's explain. What's the dip? So a lot of people have a Shabbat uh, There's alachot of Shabbat. There's thirty nine restrictions that we're not allowed to do. It's thirty nine melachot. A lot of people think that the melachot means work. It does not mean work. Okay, how do we know it doesn't mean work? Because first of all, there's no two Hebrew words that mean the same thing. There's avodah and there's melacha. Avodah comes from the root of the word avid, slave. Melacha comes from the root of the word melech, king. Hashem says that I want you to be like me. When he created the world in six days, he stopped the melachot. Why? Because he's a melech. He's a king. I want you to be like me one day a week. So don't do these things that I didn't do. So you can do. You cannot do melacha. Cannot do a melachot. But you can do avodah. So if you enjoy the work, yeah, fine. Which avodah you can do? Again, that's the point. If your if your work does not involve melachot, unfortunately, most okay, of so work. What's melacha? Okay, so melachot, you have 39 different melachot. So you have the different things, there's 39 things that we used to build the Mishkan, to build the Bet HaMikdash and the Mishkan, there was 39 things. So for example, making knots, permanent knots we're not allowed to do. Burning fire, we're not allowed to do. turning on the light? Turning on the lights, burning fire. Turning, turning on the lights, the equivalent of burning fire. Not exactly. And it's 100%. How do, I, how, do I, how do we know that? This is what we're going to do. We're going to do a test. We're going to do a test. We turn on the light bulb. Turn on the light bulb, and we put our hand on the light bulb. If after 10 minutes we go on fire, then it's fire, right? It's been done. People go on fire on a regular basis. It's, it's fire. Electricity is fire, 100%. To say that it's not fire because it's a different form of fire does not mean it's not fire. But when mentioned. someone, so, when someone so. turns on the car, turns on the car, or lights a cigarette, it's not just one violation. It's millions of violations. And it's not worth it. Because all of the Torah that someone's going to learn, all of the Takah that they're going to learn, all of the mitzvot they're going to learn, all they're going to do is give them schal in this world, because Olam Abba he doesn't have. Why? Yes. Because Shabbat is one of a few, there are three major sins. What do I mean by major sins? Every sin is not good. Murdering somebody is not good. Cheating on a wife is not good. Stealing is not good. Oh, everybody knows these logical things that even Noah, the, the people from Noah Stein knew. Every, there's a few things that we know. There's logic. Shabbat is above logic. It's not something that makes sense to us. It's a spiritual thing. But Hashem says that Shabbat is a deal between you and me. Without this deal, without you keeping Shabbat, there's no deal. There's no purpose to the world. Because you know that there's a Torah. Because you know that it's Torah is divine. Because you know that I exist and you constantly see what I do for you every day. Disagreement is everything. If you violate this agreement with the Shabbat, unfortunately, the worst punishment in the Torah are for the Shabbat violator. There's Chilul Hashem, there's Shabbat, and there's a Shfichut uh, Damin, uh, which is wasting seed. Those are the three sins where if someone does not do tshuva in this world for complete tshuva and start keeping Shabbat as the Halakha says, unfortunately, there is no end to their suffering. Meaning, without getting into too scary of an issue, but uh, everything you could recover from. There's Geinom, Geinom, you know, people describe it in different ways, but the point is that Geinom ends. There are seven levels to Geinom. 
Okay? Each level is worse than the other. One is the least. It's bad, but it's not the worst. Two is worse than one. Three is worse than two and one. And so on and so forth. But eventually, you know, let's say, for example, someone goes to the fourth. He finishes his tikkun. And that's it. He's done. He recovers. Maybe he comes back as a gilgul because he has to fix some things in this world. Or maybe he goes to Gan Eden. We don't know. Depends on his own issues. But eventually, it ends. The tikkun ends. The seventh level does not end. It's forever. And for the three sins we just mentioned, Chilul Hashem, Shabbat, and Shfichut Damim, they go in there. If they, don't, if they don't do the tikkun in this world, they stay there forever. There is no, the eternity is not, ju- is the be- is not even the beginning. And it doesn't make sense no, logically. It doesn't make sense. doesn't make sense logically. But it's in the Torah. I didn't write it. Yeah, I but should... it depends how you read the Torah. But no, no, it no, it's just this. sense to be eternally in the Gainam. Just don't be. <laughs> just don't be. Why, why suffer? I mean, <clears throat> the only reason you suffer is to learn something. If you have to suffer eternally, it's impossible, first of all, because anybody get accommodated with the time. Even if you go to the ghetto, you will get accommodated. But... It doesn't make sense. Why eternally? If you don't reach any point, it doesn't make sense. Just don't be. Don't exist. Well, that's the thing. When, when Hashem gave us Shabbat, He said, the people that violate Shabbat, mot yumat, benichreta nefesh me'amer. Me'amer. Okay. First He said death, mm-hmm. mot, yumat. So uh-huh. death upon death. It's two deaths. Uh-huh. We can't die twice. Can't die twice. We only die once, right? If we're talking about any time, by the way, just so you know, any time the Torah talks about life and death, they're never talking about life in this world. They're always talking about life in the next world. Allah Abba. So it says, Mot is a spiritual death in this world. Oh. Yumat is no Allah Abba for that person. Venichreta nefesh me'amea means that that person is no longer considered Jewish. Meaning, the Shukhan Aruch says it seven times. The Torah says it, I think, 38 times. And several other major books and Chazal explained it countless other times. A Jew can always do tshuva. That's what makes him Jewish. But to be considered not Jewish as far as being a violator of Shabbat means that they're considered under all conditions like a goy. But a goy that's not allowed to be a goy. A goy that's righteous, like for example, Job. Job, Yov. Was a righteous joy. Was a right righteous uh, goy. Was a was a prophet. Was a giant. There's a whole book in the Tanakh about him. Went through a big tikkun. Suffered a lot, but eventually he's in you know he's in Gan Eden with the with the best of them. He's a righteous goy. Someone that does the seven laws of Noah commits the seven laws of Noah and he, of Beis Hashem, Hashem based on the rules that the goys have. He's great. He's allowed to be a goy because Hashem created him as a goy. But someone that's born Jewish and decides that he's not going to listen to Hashem is not becoming a goy in a sense that he's allowed to be a goy. He's a goy meaning that Hashem is outcasting him. He's throwing him out of the nation. He doesn't want to see him. He doesn't want, to be, he doesn't want him as part of his nation. Why? Because he violated the worst law that we have between us and Hashem. Now, when they say that Hashem, people that say, listen, there's, maybe there's no gain. I, I understand this differently. It doesn't matter what you understand. I'm I telling mean, you... It's possible uh, that the other... It's uh, not... Meaning... No, there's not... I'm telling you... Okay, let's explain it this way. Let's compare an ant. There's a little ant. An ant, Shlomo Melech, tells us that we need to learn our work ethic from the ant. Okay. Why? Because the ant is always working. Even though the ant has a very short lifespan, short lifespan, they don't live a long time, they don't live 20 years. They live months before they die. But from the minute it's born to the minute it dies, it always works, every day, non-stop. Always works. We should learn our work ethic, especially for Divret Torah, from the ant. They don't live Shabbat. They don't have to keep Shabbat. But, there's the ant. And we have a lot to learn from the ant. And then there is a human being. Human being is smarter than the ant. He can talk, he can build, he can do everything that the ant does plus more, right? Right. 
So what's a good comparison? What's a good comparison? So that ant is us. And the human is Chazal. Who's Chazal? Chazal is all of the people like Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and uh, all of the major sages that took the Torah from Moshe Rabbeinu and interpreted it for us in a simple way that we can understand. All of them agree on everything that I'm telling you. I don't teach you anything that's my opinion. If I ever say my opinion, I'll tell you it's my opinion. Uh, my opinion doesn't count because I am just like everybody else. I'm the end. I know nothing. We take the teaching from the people that know. So if we understand something differently than Chazal did, if we understand something differently than what Rabbi Akiva said, or Moshe Rabbeinu said, or, uh, or even, how about this, even people from the last generation, even Rabbi Akiva Igil, or even uh, Ovadia Yosef, any of those rabbis, whether the giant ones of our generation or the giant ones which Avdi, the giant ones of 2,000 years ago, were guaranteed to be wrong. There is no possible way that you will ever be right or I will ever be right and they're wrong. Impossible. Why? Because number one, they spent their entire life from the minute they wake up to the minute they sleep learning this stuff. So it's like me going to a, a rocket scientist I never learned rocket. I, I learned a little bit of science in school and a few other places. Never learned rocket science. I go to a rocket science that works for NASA. I say, listen, by the way, this rocket you built, I don't think so. I think you made a mistake here. Where? Where do you think I made a mistake? I don't know, but I just, I just have the feeling. I have a feeling. You know you guys feeling? I got a feeling you made a mistake in this rocket. You guys going to throw me out. Maybe even get me arrested for being, put me in a mental hospital. Wait. Who am I to tell him that he made a mistake in this rocket scientist? Because he, he did it his whole life. Laavdi from him to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva tells us. Well, how do we know? I'll tell you a story. A small part of the story. Because again, I don't want to necessarily spend too much time on the scary part of Judaism. I want to spend time on the beauty of Judaism. But to, to explain another part. Mm -hmm. Also, we have to know that Chazal, many of them, had Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh means a direct connection with Hashem. Meaning, like, you live down the street from me, I could go to down the street and talk to you. Close to that. If not more even, with Hashem. Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to Hashem like I'm speaking to you right now. Panim panim. Panim The prophets got messages, direct messages, from Hashem regularly. Just like I sent you guys text messages at 3 o'clock in the morning and bother you guys to come to the Shield Torah. They got this from Hashem. They got text messages from Hashem. They got text messages from Hashem. Come to Shiur Torah. This is a mitzvah. Brit Milah. Shabbat. Kosher. This one is the king. This one's not the king. This one's a oyev. This one is a, you know, this one's a chaver. All these different things. Direct messages from them. All of them wrote this Torah. All of them agreed on this one major Torah. So now... We're going to come to them and say, listen, you guys are wrong. It doesn't make any sense. So we have some stories that is beyond something that uh, is things to just understand with a rational way. This is just a, uh, something that happened. Rabbi Yochanan one time saw Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi came to him. Rabbi Yochanan is one of the biggest sages all over the Gemara. Rabbi Yochanan. And the Yawanavi said, You want to see help? He said, Yeah, I want to see help. So he showed him help. He brought him to help. Also, Moshe Rabbeinu saw help, also, by the way. And Mount Sinai, it's one of the things that, uh, not Mount Sinai, when, uh, when Moshe Rabbeinu saw. Uh, when Hashem told him to see the uh, the land of Israel, because he wasn't able to, uh, wasn't allowed to cross the border, one of the things he allowed him to see is the future, and also heaven and hell. He saw he was able to see hell, and he was very very scared, so scared that until Hashem said specifically, "You're not going there. Don't worry," he couldn't stop being scared. Imagine Moshe Rabbeinu thought he may go to hell. Who are we, Bichlan? Mm -hmm. So Rabbi Yochanan writes everything that he saw. 
And he says the punishments that he sees he saw over there. He says women that were not modest are being hung with from their breasts. Men that didn't keep their eyes are being hung from their eyes. These things, again, this is scary, scary stuff. And I think we've reached the limit of scariness for the, for the lecture. But the point I'm trying to make to you is that these are the very same people that told us what Shabbat is. These are the very same people that told us that the punishment for violating the Shabbat is endless. So it doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter if we agree or not. It doesn't matter if we think we're smart or not. It's irrelevant. It's not, we didn't write it. Hashem didn't ask us for permission. He didn't ask Shimon, listen, do you think that uh, Shabbat is right for you or no? He didn't ask your permission. He didn't ask me for my permission. He didn't ask Moshe Rabbeinu if he agrees with this stuff. So, again, when we look at a mitzvah as if it is an obligation, it is very difficult to keep that mitzvah. If we think that a mitzvah, like keeping Shabbat or keeping kosher or keeping any mitzvah, anything that Hashem says, we think that it's an obligation, it's a burden, it's very difficult to do it. Why? Because nobody wants to do it. Imagine your wife says, you know what, honey, please, can you clean the garage for us, please? No, I don't want to clean the garage. Who wants to clean the garage? My, my I don't want to clean the garage. Who wants to clean it? But you do it because you want shalom bayit or... But, if she says, Shimon, you have a day off, you could do whatever you want. And you've been thinking about cleaning the garage because you want to put the brand new car in there and your new tool set and all the wonderful things that you've been collecting. You want to fix it. Finally, you have a day to do it. You're still doing the same thing that we were talking about before, but this time you want to do it. That's the difference. If we look at a mitzvah like it's an obligation, it is very, very difficult to do it. If we look at it as something that's rewarding to us, it's very easy to do it. How do we, know, how do we get to that point? How do we move from seeing kosher as an annoying thing that we have to keep because we all want to eat McDonald's, we all want to eat Starbucks, and we all want to do all of these things, but we can't. How do we turn now to, oh, Baruch Hashem, that my food is kosher? How? Learning Torah and connecting to the reasons behind why we're doing things is the way to learn how to love them. When someone is keeping the mitzvot, in the beginning, it's not going to be easy. They're not going to like it right away. But Hashem says, from you doing what you have to do, I will eventually help you like doing what you need to do. So, our brain works differently. We're thinking, Hashem, you know what? First, give me a million dollars. Make me rich. You know, like today, maybe you need more. Uh, Five million dollars. Ten million dollars is rich today. I don't know how much rich today is. I think 20 years ago, a million dollars was a lot of money. Today is not a lot of money. Today, a poor guy has a million dollars in America. Give me $10 million, make me rich, and then I'll be a tzaddik, I'll be like Rabbi Akiva, I'll do tshuva at age 40, I'll learn Torah 24 years. That's the way our brain works. But unfortunately, that's not the way it works. Why? Because Hashem is the king, not us. We can't make deals with Hashem. By saying that, that's saying like you're trying to blackmail Hashem. First you give me, then I'll give you. As if he needs us. He doesn't need us. If Hashem is Hashem... He's Hashem all the time, meaning that if Hashem is the creator of the world, if He is everything, if He created everything, we have to honor that. We can't go to our boss at work and say, by the way, buddy, I don't like your suit. I like a suit, you're fired. What do you mean you don't like my suit? Hey, your lecture, by the way, I don't like it. I think, you're, uh, I think you need to work a little harder, Mr. CEO. You need to work harder. Get out of my company, you're fired. I'll make sure you don't get unemployment. This is the boss. Le'avdi from this guy to Hashem. But again, the point is that if Hashem is really Hashem, you have to realize that. Say, Listen, I can't blackmail Hashem. Listen, you give me this and then I'll do it. We have to believe that if we do it, we'll only have good. And there's a test. Hashem will test us. So in the beginning of this parasha, Hashem has explained to us the Brit Milah is the first 
part of our covenant. It's the first part of the deal between me and the Jewish people. But that Brit can put the other deal that I have with them, because I have three of them. I have three covenants with Am Yisrael. One is the Brit Milah, one is the Brit of the Shabbat, and one is the Brit of the Tefillin. These are the three things that are the covenants between us, specifically called covenants. They're not called mitzvot, they're called covenants. Shabbat. Called brit. Why? Shabbat. Because this brit. is the deal between us and, and, and Hashem. Without this, we have no connection. So it's like saying, listen, I have this piece of property. I want to sell this building for $50 million. Okay, I'm going to sell this $50 million. I have a buyer. Oh, buyer, you want to see this property? You like the property? Yeah, great. Okay. So what do you think? You're going to buy it? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, but you know what? I didn't make an agreement with the actual owner. I don't know if he wants to sell it. You think that's a good deal? No. First, you have to convince the owner to sell it. Then you bring a buyer. So again, we have to convince the owner, which is Hashem, to be with us. Then we can do other things. And the key to tshuva, Chazal tells us, if someone wants to do tshuva, they have to keep Shabbat. Why? Because without Shabbat, there is no Judaism. And again, in the beginning, it will be tough. I'm not going to tell anyone some type of, uh, whether it's on the internet or anywhere else that's watching this, you or he or anywhere, or it's trying to convince anyone else. I'm not going to sell you any stories that going from keeping nothing to keeping everything is going to be uh, easy. But again, if we believe that the creator of the world is who he is and who he says he is, that means he doesn't change his mind. That means he's not like a human being where he says one thing today and something different the next day. That means that whatever he says is going to be. So we have to realize that he promised us all of the good that's in this world, that all of the generations put together had, is not even the equivalent of one hour of someone that goes to Gan Eden. Who goes to Gan Eden? Shomer Shabbat. Without, without Shmiat Shabbat, there's no Gan Eden. So if you include, let's say the good in this world is money. Money makes people happy. Okay, let's, let's, let's imagine money makes people happy. Women, okay. Men, men okay. Uh, food, okay. All the desires in the world. We have 7 billion people now, 7 billion people in the last generation, 6 and a half before. All, let's say 100 billion people have ever existed. Combine all of the good that they ever had in their entire life is not even one hour of Olam Abba. Who goes in Olam Abba? Shomer Shabbat. It's a good deal. It's a good deal. I mean, did you imagine? It's, 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 it's one thing. You mean you can be a thief in the middle of the week and Shomer Shabbat? Huh? You can do bad things in the middle of the week and then Shomer Shabbat will cover everything? Yeah. I'm not saying that if you Shomer Shabbat, you're guaranteed to get a Lama You have the ability to go to a Lama Without Shmirat Shabbat, you have no chance of, of, of going to a Lama Not you, Chas Vechalila, anybody. Without Shmirat Shabbat, there is zero chance. You could be the best Torah scholar in history. You could be bigger than Moshe Rabbeinu in Torah. You could give more tzedakah than uh, any person in history. You can do tefillin 10 times a day. You can do everything else. Everything, every mitzvah, 613 mitzvot. We can't really do all of them because we don't have bed mikdash, but you found a way to do 612. And you don't do Shabbat? No, no, no. Shabbat, just one, one. One cancels everything. There's no deal. So again, it doesn't make sense to us, but it's not supposed to always make sense to us. This is Hashem we're dealing with. If we understood... Rambam said this. If I understood everything that Hashem did, I would be Him. If we really understood everything that Hashem is, and everything that He says, and had the level of capability like Hashem does, we would be Hashem. So you can't really expect to understand everything completely. Hashem said, listen, the reality of it is that I gave you every mitzvah to do because I said so. That's the real reason. Because He said to do it, you do it. But there's different reasons, there's different benefits of every mitzvah. So for example, the Brit Milah. We know scientifically today that over the last 20 years there's been a lot of research, especially in the United Kingdom, in England. They've done a, a lot of research about it. 
And we know that health-wise, it's a drastic benefit to do Brit Milah. The amount of diseases that people get drops by over 90%. The ability to get diseases is, is, is very easy in this world. So when you have something that helps you lower that by 90% is amazing. The, um, the ability to reproduce is obviously improves. Um, and also something very, very unique about the Brit Milah that shows that the creator that put it there knows what he's talking about is that people that go against the Brit Milah say, oh no, it's dangerous, you know, so once in a while someone dies, a baby dies. It happened in history, people died, but, uh, dry, you know, it's a very, very small, small, small percentage. It's very, very rare. But we say, do it on the eighth day. Okay, eighth day. So scientists will always say, okay, you know what, why don't you wait at least a month? Let the baby grow up a little bit, maybe build their immune system, be a little stronger, then do it. Why are you waiting eight days? The guy's only eight days old. Leave him alone. We scan. There's something called vitamin K. Vitamin K, in addition to your white blood cells, are the things that help you heal. If someone doesn't have white blood cells, they can't heal. So, for example, when someone has, has AIDS, their white blood cells, little by little, disintegrate and they go away and someone can't heal, so even a, a simple cold can kill them. Vitamin K is one of the things that helps your blood clot. So, it, so if someone gets a cut, in order for that blood clot to stop the cut and become you know, skin again, and stop the bleeding so you don't bleed out forever, you need vitamin K. Now we know scientifically now that whatever we're born with as far as vitamin K throughout the rest of our life continues to lower. So let's say, for example, we're, we start at 100%. Every day, for the rest of our life, we have less. We cannot increase it. We're, kind of, we're going to go from 100%. By the time we're 10 years old, we have, let's say, 95. By the time we're uh, you know, 20 years old, we have 90, and so on and so forth. By the time we're 70 years old, we have 50. That's why you also see a lot of people get, you know, have a hard time healing when they get older. Except one day. On the eighth day of a person's life, they have 116% vitamin K. Just that one day. So imagine that. The one day that we really, really need to heal very quickly, Hashem gives us a little bit of a boost of vitamin K, so we heal, and that's why you see the baby stop crying within maybe 30 seconds, a minute. Why? Because he already healed. To us, it hurts because we saw we're not used to this stuff. But the baby, is done. he's forgot about it already. He's healed. So scientifically, you see that something that was written 3,300 years ago, they knew what they were talking about. There's a few other things that are very interesting that are not necessarily that relevant to this parasha, but it's, I think it's very important to know that when people talk about the Torah, they talk about two things. They talk about both the written Torah, which is the Chumash, the Tanakh, but they're also talking about the oral Torah, which is the Gemara, the Zohar, the Mishnayot. A lot of people that don't know a lot of Torah always have a problem with that part, with the oral Torah. Like, ah, maybe it's a bunch of rabbis. That's what I used to think, by the way. I used to think it's just a bunch of rabbis that argue. So who wants to listen to these? Oh, I don't want to argue. Then I started learning Gemara. And I realized they're not arguing at all about what I thought they were arguing about. They're not arguing about whether it's black or white. They're not arguing about whether to keep Shabbat or not keep Shabbat. What they're arguing about is whether you need to do Kriyat Shema at one specific time or 12 minutes before. So you have 15 pages in the Gemara are arguing about 15 minutes. 15 minutes. They're arguing. About, they're not arguing about whether you have to keep. They're all Jewish. <laughs> if they're Jewish, there has to be arguing. What do you that's, mean? That's where it comes but from. the point is, is that they're not arguing whether you have to do Kriyat Shema or not. Of course, you have to do Kriyat Shema. They say you don't do Kriyat Shema. Can you even like consider yourself? Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel, they all agree about everything, but they disagree on. Specific. Tiny little details of how to perfect 
the mitzvah. Not whether to do the mitzvah or not, but how to perfect it. Why? Because they know that one day they're going to go in front of Borei Olam and they're going to say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I tried my best. And this is what I did, and this is what I did, and this is what I did. Instead of the other guy that says, Oh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're really real. No, I didn't try nothing. Sorry. Can I get another shot? I want to be ready. So, the Gemara is also divine. How do we know it's divine? Because it has specific information in it that only the Creator could have known. There's no way that a human being had the resources or ability to know it. And there's a lot of things that we're, since we're talking about a little bit about medicine and health, a lot of people give a lot of credit to modern science. They give a lot of credit to doctors and scientists and they say, oh, the sign of the Chacham, the guy's a PhD, and an MD, and a this D, and he has a this thing, and he has a noble, and a fun bubble, and a bars of noble, and all of these bubbles, and he's great. Unfortunately, what they don't realize is that everything that he knows is already in the Torah. Nothing new is under the sun, meaning there's no new information that was created or invented in any generation beyond the Torah. It was already in there. How do we know it? Because we find it. The more we look, we find it already in Torah. So people say, yeah, what? Well, come on, look at this doctor, he created uh, this, he created this, he created this. Look enough, you'll find it. So here's some things that we see in the Gemara. Gemara, not the written Torah, in the Gemara. Why, the Gemara. Why is the Gemara really important? Because the Gemara is the thing that people have a problem with. Everyone agrees, even the Muslims and the Christians say that the Chamisha Chum Shet Torah, the five books of Moses are real. Everyone agrees. We were at Sinai, Hashem spoke, we saw the words in Shemaim, we came out of Egypt, there's proof, the scientific, archaeological proof. No one disagrees. At least people that are religious, or at least believe that there's a creator, they all agree that this is a divine book. If you have religion in your life, you have to agree you have a divine book. Some people disagree with certain things, they don't want to keep certain things, but no one says that, hey, this is not real. If you know it. Some people don't know it, that's a different shiul. But... The part that most people have a problem with is the Gemara. <coughs> because they think it's a bunch of rabbis that are arguing. So we have a lot of information regarding medicine in the Gemara. I used to remember as a kid, people would tell me, you know, there's really the cure for every disease is in the Torah. I used to find it so fascinating, but I didn't know how to get there. I didn't know how to find out this stuff. So it's amazing you see some of this stuff. So here, I'll, I'll go over some of this list. So, in 1962, so just, you know, 60 or so years ago, we came up with a system called the CPR, mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. And people got a lot of credit for doing the mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. There's a book called Yalkut Shimoni. Yalkut Shimoni is, you know, part of the Midrash. Chazal in there explains that when the spies, the Meraglim, that Moses sent to Eretz Israel, went to Eretz Israel to see the land, to see, to check it out before all of Am Israel went there, they got there. Now, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, had giants living there. And the giants saw the Meraglim. And they screamed at them so loud that they all passed out. It all fell, passed out. And then it describes that the Canaanites, a few people that were living there, revived them by giving them breath mouth to mouth. Specifically says mouth to mouth. Specifically describing the same thing that we call CPR in the Torah that happened 3,300 years ago. This is an Igma. This is an Igma. And they take it from Igma and it goes to Yakuchi Moni. This is one of them. So what we got a lot of credit for 60 years ago, you could find it in a book that was written many, many, many hundred years ago. Hundreds of years ago. Okay, another one. This one is cute. It's nice. There's also something where when somebody has a, uh, had a breathing problem, they would puncture a hole, sometimes in his neck or sometimes directly to the mouth, to bring air to, to puncture his lungs to, so they can breathe. This has already been done for about 200 years. This type of uh, thing. It's about 200 years by modern science. 
Acupuncture. No, no acupuncture. Putting a tube, tube, so you can breathe. Somebody that's choking or somebody that's going. So someone by the name of Baal Turim. Baal Turim lived 700 years ago. Okay? So he couldn't write it in 200 years ago. He lived 700 years ago. And he's writing about the Midrash for two women, Shifra and Pua. Who is Shifra and Pua? Shifra and Pua were the two women that were the maidens that were actually helping um, uh, deliver the babies in Egypt 3,300 years ago. And he says, how did Shifra get her name? Because her name wasn't really Shifra. Shifra was really Moses' mother. Shifra got her name from the tool that she used called Shforferet. Shforferet was the tool that she would use to revive the babies that were born uh, without breathing. She would use the tube, the same tube that they discovered 200 years ago. She was already using it 3,300 years ago. Now, if you don't believe the story that she was using it 3,000 years ago, you still can't say that the guy that wrote this 700 years ago knew about what's happened 200 years ago. Either way, the book, where the information that we got it from was 700 years ago. Where he's getting it from is from 3,000 years ago. Either way, it's before now. It's like kosher meat. You put salt. You disinfect it. Yes, but I'm talking about a medical tool that someone is using. That people are giving all this credit to, 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 to doctors. And again, if you just read enough Torah, you, you see it. I'll finish, this, this is a bunch of things in it. Another one is, oh, this is one actually one of the things I like the most. So anesthesia. Anesthesia is someone who has a surgery. Obviously, it's not pleasant to have a surgery if you're awake. Mm-hmm. In the old days, they used to get the guy drunk. They would give him a lot of liquor and they would make him drunk. Then about 200 years ago, they found that there is a, uh, you know, different oils and different things that they could, you know, almost like poison actually, and they would make him go to sleep. About 200 years ago. So because the alcohol, people would wake up out of it, they would still suffer. So they figured we have to put him to sleep, and they succeeded. In the Gemara, Gemara was written nearly 2,000 years ago, about 1,600 years ago was put together, but the stories in the Gemara are from at least 2,500 years ago. Anyway, in the Gemara, there is a story about uh, Rabbi Eliezer, I believe, uh, Ben Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He was a giant, huge, fat, very fat, big tzaddik. But he was fat, overweight. But overweight to the point where they describe him that he, if he and another sage put their stomachs together, they were so big that a bull can walk under them. That's how big they were. Wow. <laughs> big. Real big. So one time, one of the people of the town says, you know what, you, your father is like wine, but you're like vinegar. Meaning your father is a tzaddik, but you're a rasha. Why? Because uh, uh, Abiel used to rat on the people that were stealing from the nation. If someone was a uh, Jew but was stealing from people, he would tell the Romans about it. Because he didn't want the people to suffer. Right. So people, nobody likes, likes someone that's telling the enemy about them. So he said, so he started questioning himself. He's saying, wait, is Hashem upset with me? Because I know that when I die, I'm going to go in a grave like everyone else. And the first year that someone is in the grave is when the worms eat the body. The maggots and worms eat the body. And when someone's overweight, they end up suffering because of that. Now, you're not allowed to be overweight. So he wanted to know if he's going to suffer more than the average person because he knows a lot of Torah. He's a big tzaddik. So he decided to say, you know what, I want to have a certain, I want to see if my flesh is also holy like my neshama is. So they describe in detail a surgery that we call today liposuction. Where they put him on a granite table. Why granite? We all know today why. Granite doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, uh, have uh, disease on it. doesn't have uh, bacteria. It doesn't stick on, on granite. This is 2,000 years ago they already knew this. And then they specifically said, we gave him a potion to put him to sleep. Same exact thing used for anesthesia. 
the end of that story goes, they took three buckets full of fat out of his body, and he left those buckets out outside in the sun in Israel to see what would happen to them. Obviously, you know this, if we leave a piece of steak outside for three hours, it's full of maggots and worms and everything. They left it for a few weeks. For a few weeks, not even a fly touched his, uh, touched his, uh, his fat and his uh, things that they took out of his body. So then he said, Baruch Hashem, even my body is holy like my neshama from all the Torah I've been learning. But the point I want to try to make here is that this is in the Gemara, Masechet Baba Metzia, page 83, uh, Tzad Bet. Uh, and it's, uh, again, all these things, I have pages for you guys if you ever want to look at this stuff. I have the pages, the numbers, where, and so on, what Masechet it is. So he says that even as, uh, you know, they gave him a, uh, a sleeping drug, a sleeping potion. Same thing we use for light for anesthesia today. Another thing we have is uh, in 1881, we finally figured out that flies carry disease. Flies and uh, mosquitoes carry disease. They're a disgusting little creature, but they exist nonetheless. In 1881, about 130 or so years ago, we finally figured out, scientists finally realized that uh, we have to be careful from these things, from mosquitoes and flies. If they would have read the Gemara Masechet Ketubot, page 77, they would see that Rabbi Yochanan said, specifically, be careful of flies, of a Baal Raton, Baal Raton was a specific person, that will transfer disease. This is not, you don't have to be a genius to understand this. You don't need to be a big Chacham to understand this. It says specifically, transfer disease. Why did they, they didn't read the Gemara? I don't know, but... It was already there 2,000 years before they figured it out. Next one is, this is actually very interesting. Um, uh, this is about medicine. Medicine, so uh, we all know that, you know, having, uh, for example, uh, an open cut is not good. And especially if you have a cut that's from metal. If the metal is rusted, you can get this way. You get tetanus from it. So in Masechet, uh, Masechet Shabbat, it talks about how somebody had an open cut, but he's allowed not only to violate the Shabbat, because they said that if he had an open cut, he has to put silver on it to disinfect it. And he ha he's allowed to carry it even if it's the silver. It's a silver coin. You're not allowed to carry money on Shabbat. He said you're allowed to carry even a silver coin to put it on top of your wound because it's a pikuach nefesh. Because they already knew that if he got cut from a metal, he could literally die. Another thing that's probably interesting for, for women is there's something called, and uh, this is <coughs> this is in uh, Masechet Megillah, uh, page 13. It's something called opakino. Opakino, you know, women always think about, you know, that they're not favored in the Torah. Not, there's not as many stories about women as there is about men. Opakino is actually something, you know, it's, uh, it was a special oil of olives that only reached about a third of their growth. The Gemara describes them as that. And women use them. Men would ask their women to, use, to, to get this, especially kings, especially people that were rich. Why? Because the, uh, this specific oil would make the hair, uh, 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 would take out their hair off their body hair, and would make their skin glow. Mm -hmm. So this, this is something interesting. Number one, it's probably not going to be interesting for you guys, but interesting for, for women more so, because women care about stuff like this. I don't think you guys care about shaving your body. But... The, uh, the interesting part about this is that people think when they, when they go to a science class in school, they give them a visual of these, you know, monkey and eventually becomes a human being. So everybody thinks that, you know, in the old days, like three, five, you know, two, uh, 2,000 years ago, let's say, people were like animals. That's what they think. That's what science makes you think. They make you think that everybody had body hair and they were ugly and smelly and they were like animals. In reality, some of the things that they use and they describe in the Torah of how these people live, it's much, much better than us. 
Um, so, you know, women worried about, you know, every single thing that women worry about today, even more so back then. They had much better tools than we do. And this is actually just one of the things I noticed, actually, in the Gemara, that uh, was a special oil <laughs> that made their skin glow. And if you ask any woman in the world whether she wants her skin to glow, the answer is always going to be yes. Uh, another what thing... Olive leaf? It's olive. Olives, actual olives, but they are olives... The leaf, the leaf of the olive. No, no, the actual olive. Olive itself. Because today they sell olive leaf capsules. It's good for the skin. Maybe, but this is the actual olives. They would make an oil out of it, but it's specific olives that haven't reached full growth. They're not mature olives. And uh, they would use this specific oil in a certain way, and they would make... It would, I think there's a uh, product for women called Nair. Nair is like a cream that women put on their bodies to take off the hair instead of shaving. And they use cream to make their skin look. So this, this oil would do both. So it's kind of cool. Um... Anything. Oh, this this is actually this is very interesting. Um, um, okay. um, in Masechet Ktubot, Daf Shivim Sheva, Daf page seventy-seven, it talks about. How to heal a balatan? Balatan were people who had brain tumors. You know, today someone has brain surgery; it's a big, uh, big deal to do brain surgery. So in Masechet Ketubot, they discuss how to heal this balatan, how to actually do, to do the procedure, brain surgery, and they specifically talk about how to only do it with a knife. And not with a saw, because, you know, back then, it's not like uh, they had the tools like we had today, but at the same token, they uh, weren't exactly cavemen like we think. You know, they're talking about specifically how to use this knife, but before they use the knife, they use something that we don't have today, which was a specific type of lotion that they would make to soften the skull. So it would make it very easy to cut the, uh, cut the head, so the person wouldn't have scars and injuries and things like that. So it's uh, amazing. Another thing that's very interesting is they talk about AIDS. As I'm sure you all know, AIDS is only something that we've had in, uh, scientifically since the 70s or 60s or something like that when people went crazy. But the Torah knew about AIDS for a long time. Uh, Midrash Rabbah, about Masichet Sota, says that any place that will have a high level of promiscuity will have a plague of germs that destroy the body and the white blood cells. What is a plague of germs? Where is it written? Masech and Midrash Rabbah. Midrash Rabbah is a, is a Midrash. It's a book. When did you write it? This is almost 2,000 years ago. Wow. 2,000, maybe a little more than 2,000 years ago. Wow. Definitely not 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, so, what's germs? Destroying the body and specifically the white blood cells. The definition of AIDS. Where does AIDS come from? Promiscuity. No, from gays. What are gays? <laughs> well, what there, are... Is there is promiscuity and there is gays. In general, once people that are homosexual are promiscuous. Oh, that's one of them. It could, you yeah. can have it from a needle. Yeah, but it didn't come from a heterosexual. Needles. Irrelevant. The, the, the point of if this or that obviously is, is irrelevant. Yeah, the point is that it's a... Uh, um, it doesn't matter what, what Rabbi Simlai, Rabbi Simlai, Rabbi Simlai says that uh, he calls it a specific name. Actually, anywhere you see Znut Andra, Andra Musi comes to the world and kills good or bad. Andra Musi is the is the plague, and he says, and it kills. Righteous or uh, wicked people, doesn't matter. How about, it doesn't have to be epidemic. How about Daesh and ISIS? Maybe they are here because there is prosecuity, there is bad things in the world. Who? ISIS. ISIS. Oh, you mean, yeah, of course. All, all punishments for no reason. All punishments, all, all things that happen in the world happen for a reason, of course. Um, then there is uh, the... Um, 
this is actually very interesting. Uh, obviously, you guys know what bacteria is. There's a French scientist from the 1800 called Louis, Louis Pasteur. Pasteur. Okay, Louis Pasteur. So, my fellow Frenchman over here knows who he is. So, Louis Pasteur got okay. famous for, uh, in essence, discovering what bacteria was. Even though about in the 1600 there was somebody else with a very long name I can't pronounce. Um, starts with an L. But he already started uh, uh, putting together a microscope that was able to see 20 times normal and he saw things moving. But Louis Pasteur got to a point where he uh, discovered b bacteria to the world and he um, realized that Heating milk is going, to kill, is, is going to uh, uh, kill the germs that we didn't even know exist. And that's why they named heating milk pasteurizing after his name. Now, if... So this has happened again in the 1800s. If any of these people read what Rabbi Eliezer, the great, said in Masechet Derech Eretz, Chapter 7, and also in, in uh, Tureh Zav, two different sources, not just one, two. Abiel explains the, the uh, Midrash that says, A man shall not drink from a cup, then give it to another because of life threatening dangers. He explains it <clears throat> that perhaps there is illness in that man's body that will transfer to the cup and into the mouth of his friend. And kill him. So yeah, all of this stuff is in the Torah. It's amazing. Uh, uh, actually, uh, another source, Rabbi Yochanan said, Rabbi Yochanan said, a person is better off draining, drinking a, a cup full of witchcraft. It was witches back then. A cup full of witchcraft, which usually they would try to poison people. So a person is better off drinking a cup full of witchcraft Instead of drinking a cup full of tapped water, tepid water. Because remember, in those days, they would take water out of the ground. It, was, it wasn't like always clean. Mm -hmm. So in order to drink this water, you would always have to heat it up. Yeah. So Abi Yochanan knew this. He said, if you drink the water without heating it up, there's still going to be germs in there. So he said, you're better off already drinking with the witchcraft than, than having this disease you're going to get from this. And he says... Uh, brew the cup of, um, in other words, it's better to drink a witchcraft's brew than a cup of unboiled water because of the damaging it does to, its, to the health. And there's a bunch of other things that are very, very interesting and more if you guys want to know more about the health part. But all of this stuff is in the Torah, which the point I'm trying to make it out of all of these uh, facts is that when someone talks about the Gemara, the oral Torah, we can't discredit it. Because, again, the wisdom that's in it is nothing less than divine. It's nothing less than it had to come from the Borei Olam. It had to come from the creator of the world because we didn't have MRIs and CAT scans and microscopes and telescopes and all of the... We didn't have any of this stuff. I mean, we have in Masechet Brachot, page 32, it says the exact number of stars that are in the universe. One, zero, six, four, three, four, zero, and 12 zeros after it. Exact number of, of stars... Exact number. Only in the last 25 years, 20 years, did science finally have the ability to figure out even a close estimate to how many stars. And how did they come up with? They come up with a very similar number. So again, in those days when this was written, 2,000 years ago, people still thought there's maybe 800 stars because that's all they could see with their eyes. Then a few hundred years passed, they thought there's 8,000 stars then the 1600s, Galileo Galilei came up with the telescope, and he said, no, you're wrong, there's a few thousand stars, and maybe a few million, and only after the telescope advanced over the next 400 years, getting to today, people have a supercomputer connected to a telescope, and they say, okay, there's 10 to the 18th power. This is pretty much a very similar number to what the Torah already said. But we actually have an exact number. So, again, the wisdom... It's in the Torah is nothing less than divine. How does this help us? It helps us do the mitzvot in a way where if we know for sure that God exists and He wrote everything that's in the Torah, everything that's in the written Torah, and everything that Chazal says, 
that they say comes from him, they, we know the source. Then we know we have no choice. We have to do it. We have to do it. It's better we start liking it than not liking it because, listen, we have to do it either way. Hashem says there is an eye that's watching. This is in Perkevot. An eye that's watching. An ear that's hearing. And everything that you do is written in his book. Because one day, we're going to have to go up there and he's going to show us everything that we did. There's no such thing as what the Greeks used to think. The Greeks used to believe in God. They said, no, no, there's a God. But he left. He created the world and he left. He doesn't care about what you're doing. He doesn't care if you do a bracha on this tea. He doesn't care if you do, uh, you know, a shayatza when you leave the bathroom. He doesn't care if you do all those things. He doesn't care. What does he care? Look, he's everything. He's amazing. He doesn't care about us. That's what a lot of people think. They're like, yeah, listen, there's a God. I agree. There's no way that the world was created in such an amazing way without a God. It has to be something. Anyone that has a little bit of a brain believes in God. Even a lot of smart people don't believe in God, but they know there has to be something. There has to be an intelligent design. Call it God, call it whatever you want. It has to be something behind everything. So now, the Greek said, yes, there's a God, but he left. He doesn't care about us. This goes against everything that Torah says. Because Torah says, I gave you the world, and I gave this world that I created instructions. Those instructions are called the Torah. Torah Bechtav, Torah Be'alpeh, Torah, Oral Torah and the Written Torah. Read the instructions. They're not only going to make Hashem happy to a sense that obviously you're achieving your purpose, but it'll also benefit us in a way that we will be happy. So much so that Chazal explains to us that there's no such thing as real happiness without Torah. No such thing. Give somebody a million dollars, a hundred million dollars, a billion dollars, I'll show you somebody that's depressed with all that money. Give somebody the most beautiful women in the world, I'll show you somebody that doesn't want any of them. Anything material that people connect to and try to chase their whole life, I'll show you at least dozens of people that don't want it. Which means, that it's obviously, that's not the purpose of this life. It doesn't make people happy. Happiness is a spiritual feeling. In this parasha, going back to it, we have this disease called tzarat. Tzarat is mistaken often to be something called leprosy. It's not leprosy. People think it's leprosy because part of the parasha says that a a man or a woman has spots on the skin of their flesh, white spots. So they think that this is the only part of the, of the disease. Tzarat does not only include just spots. Tzarat is actually a spiritual disease, meaning that it manifests a spiritual action into something that's physical. Tzarat very much exists still today. There's actually a hospital in Jerusalem full of people that have tzarat and there's no cure. What are they good at for? Tzarat is given for ten reasons. There are ten reasons why people get tzarat. Again, this is a spiritual thing, so it's not something that uh, you get from, uh, you know, drinking a bacteria full, you know, a cup full of coffee full of bacteria. There are ten reasons why somebody gets tzarat. Slander, which is shemra, somebody saying this is usually the cause. Shemra. Someone that lies about somebody else. Somebody that uh, makes rumors about somebody. Oh, listen, I think he cheats on his wife. Oh, listen, I think he lies to his customers. Uh, you know, people, unfortunately, say things like this. I don't know why, but they do it. Another reason is idol worship. Another reason is sex crimes. Gilu'e ayot. Sex crimes are not necessarily just uh, what we think logically like uh, um, rape. Uh, you think the sex crimes, you think the law. Sex crimes is not just rape. Sex crimes also means being with your wife if, she, if you don't keep tarat mishpacha. If, you, if your wife did not go to the mikveh, you're not allowed to be with her. If your wife is nida, you're not allowed to be with her. So much so that the Torah explains that being with a woman that's nida is worse than being with your own mother. 
Okay, and so I, I give you guys extreme examples, not to disgust you or to uh, make you think bad thoughts or to scare you, but the reason why I have to give you extreme examples is because if something is relevant to an extreme example, of course it's relevant to a small example. You understand what I mean? If, let's say, for example, I am, uh, I, it's, you know, Chilul Shabbat, for example, is worse than murder, and obviously it's worse than stealing. You understand? Murder is really bad. Stealing is less bad than, than murder. So I'm telling you that Shabbat, Chilul Shabbat, violating Shabbat is worse than murder. You're better off murdering every day than, than violating Shabbat. That's, that's, that's what the Torah tells us. Okay? It doesn't make logical sense. It doesn't always have to. But this is what Torah says to us. This is what the divine Torah that we're going over says. Not me, not any rabbi. I'm talking about Hashem. It says to us. So the extreme examples I give you is to dig the point into your head so you don't think that it's okay. It's not okay. This is why being with a woman before you're married is not a good idea. Because being with a woman before you're married violates two major, major sins. I don't mean being with a woman like, uh, you know, being friends with a woman, being being intimate with a woman. It's very bad because there's two major things. Both of them are discussed in this parasha, which is the reason why I'll mention them. One is the whole issue of nida that we just talked about. A woman doesn't go to the mikveh, not allowed to be with her. Obviously, someone that's not married cannot go to the mikveh. Okay, so that's one problem. Second thing is called shfichut damim. Shfichut damim is wasting seed. Wasting seed is such a bad sin, such a bad sin that we already know it from Parashat Noah. Meaning that we already know it before we got the Torah. Before we got the Torah, after Hashem saw that He created the world and everybody became evil, there were many, many sins they were doing. And He decided to destroy the world. After He destroyed the world, he gave Noah seven laws. Seven laws. But those seven laws are not as simple as reading seven bullets, like seven words. Those laws have details that he says. One of them is he says, Okay, so this is he's pretty much telling you you shouldn't kill somebody. Now it says, Shofech dam mea adam, badam damo ishafech. Ki betzerem Elohim asayit adam. Okay, so it says, the one who spills blood of a person, the person's blood, meaning is there's two forms of blood, that you're spilling by spilling blood. What's two forms of blood? Somebody kills only one form of blood. You kill them, that's it. There's one form of blood comes out, they're dead. That's it, done, right? Spilling blood, what he's referring to here is someone that's wasting seed, someone that... Uh, has intimate relationships with a woman without a purpose of actually having a child. So in Judaism, you're not allowed to use a condom, um, but you're not necessarily supposed to torture the woman and have her uh, have 500 kids until she uh, has depression or dies either. So there are different ways, kosher ways, to restrict for the better of the health. You're also not allowed to do it to that extent. You're not allowed to just constantly impregnate the woman with her, at her uh, 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 wants, desire, and so on. You have to obviously protect her health also. So there's, a certain, there's, there's certain laws for this stuff. There's a certain amount of time that you have to wait. There's a certain amount of be, between children. There is a, uh, you know, and, and so on. We can go over some of this stuff. But again, the point I'm trying to make here is that the things that, unfortunately, many, many people do, especially when they're young, young kids, teenagers... Uh, they don't know the stuff. The good news is that they call Hashem the merciful one. What does it mean, the merciful one? Merciful one means two major things that are very, very important for us so we're not leaving this lecture depressed. One important thing is that Hashem has unlimited patience. Unlimited patience, meaning that He continues to let us live in this world despite our sins in the hopes that we will do tshuva. It's very good news. The second thing it means, merciful one, is that everyone is able to do tshuva. 
So if we're sinning today, we could stop. And tomorrow we're tzaddikim already. Meaning that the sins that we've made, when we do, when we stop sinning because we're scared, the sins that we made turn into accidental sins. So it's much, much less. If we're doing it because we want to make Hashem happy and we love Him, then the sins that we made turn into mitzvot. Complete opposite. So tshuva is not just a, hey, listen, let's just keep a couple of mitzvot, I'll say bracha when I leave the bathroom, when I drink some tea, and, uh, you know, maybe one day uh, people are going to say I'm religious. No, no, tshuva has a big, big uh, potential, big upside. You can literally buy your whole world in a minute in this world by, by doing the right thing. There, um, there's actually a famous story in... Um, During the time of uh, the destruction of Bet Hamikdash, the the Romans were obviously killing a lot of the tzaddikim, and one of them, they were going to burn him with the Sefer Torah wrapped around him. So the uh, Roman looked at him. He said, "Rabbi, listen, I uh, I know your Torah is." There's a good chance of being real. But these people, they want to burn, they want you to suffer. They're putting even uh, different things between you to separate you from the Sefer Torah, so it takes longer to burn you. They really want you to suffer. But if I increase the fire right away, you die one shot. If I do that for you, Rabbi, you promise me that I come with you to Allah Abba? Rabbi said, yeah. And he did it, he lit the fire, and then the Roman jumped into the fire with him. And a bat call, a heavenly voice, came out from Shemaim and saying, Welcome the, the, the sage and this person to the Allah Abba. And the sages that were alive still saying, How lucky is a man? I think it was Rabbi Yudan Nasi said, How lucky is a man that bought his world, bought the Allah Abba in a single moment? The key for us is not necessarily to have this expectation to live, to buy our entire world, our entire future in one moment, but we don't really know the significance of one mitzvah over another based on the reward that we get. We know the significance based on punishment, what's worse than the other. But the reward that we get for each mitzvah, we don't know. Hashem didn't tell us this, and even the sages don't really tell us this, because they don't want someone to think that doing a bracha on a cup of tea is not a big deal. You don't really get that much. But doing, a, let's say, a bracha on go, you know, leaving the bathroom, you have to do. Because they want you to think that every mitzvah that you're doing is important as the other one. Your reward is going to be just as much. There's a few things that we know that if we don't do them, it's a big problem like we talked about. But the reward that we can get for some of these things is endless. We said a story, I think it was last week, a couple of weeks ago, but it's still a worth, worthwhile story. Someone went to the Chafetz Chaim and uh, said to him, listen, I'm uh, very, uh, very poor. I can't make panasa. I know the value of Torah. I know that uh, Torah is real. But maybe you can talk to Hashem for me. You're a tzaddik, you talk to Hashem for me. And tell him, listen, take the schut that I have for tefillin, that I do tefillin, take the tzchut that I have for tefillin, and uh, maybe give me some panasa, some more money. So the rabbi says, I'll answer you with a story. He says, one time there was a man, all his life he saved money. Very, very frugal, wanted to save all the money that he had. Because he said, one day I'm going to retire, I want to marry my kids, I want to... Have some money. I don't want to be uh, working my whole life. So, every day you put money away, put money away, put money away. Eventually, he got all this money put together and he bought a, you know, a few gold coins, five gold coins. This is his life savings, five gold coins. So he wants these coins. This is worth a lot of money. This is more than a few years' salary, this gold coin. So he put, you know, he wanted to hide the gold coins. You know, back in those days, they didn't have safes like we have. So he put it on top of the dresser. 
So one day his little boy, his son, is playing in the house, he's climbing, he's jumping, he's this, he's that, and you hear ding, 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 he hears something shaking. So he climbs the dresser and he touches on top and he sees that there's a coin somewhere. He takes it, oh, great! And he runs to the makolet, he runs to the uh, store. He gives it to the, to, to the guy working at the store. He goes, how much candy can I buy? The guy is so amazed, he's like, anything you want. So the kid starts taking stuff and runs home. He's so excited, six-year-old kid comes home with all this candy. So his family sees him, like, where'd you get this candy, this candy son? Because I got it from the store. He goes, how'd you, how'd you get this candy? He goes, oh, I bought it, don't worry, I bought it, I bought it, Abba. Immediately, the father went to the uh, dresser to go see if he took his money. He sees that one of the five coins is missing, 20% of his money is missing. He runs to the store, and he says to the uh, owner, to the balabait over there, he says, Asha, you knew my son is my son. You knew that that gold so coin is a lot more valuable than the stupid candy that you gave him. You weren't supposed to do that. And he's right. He's right. You can't yes. buy, you know, five-year salary for a bunch of candies. Asha. So Hafez Chaim comes back to this guy, and he says, you know, he's right. He doesn't, he, the, the, uh, the store owner is a, is a thief. Chafetz Chaim says, I don't want to be a thief. Because you want to give the schut of the tefillin for some money. But you don't realize the money that you want is not even candy next to the schut that you have in tefillin in Allah Abba. I don't want to be a thief. I don't want to be part of this crime. So I'm not going to help you with this mitzvah because I know Hashem is going to give you anyway. You don't have to give up your tefillin for that. So we need to know that the mitzvot that we do... It's a lot of, lot of reward we're going to get. It also says, if you read Berkat Amazon, anytime you eat bread, now it becomes the country, below it's the Dikne Ezab. It says, I've lived, I was young, I was old, but I've never seen a righteous person have to beg, or his, sin, or his children not have the food, not having to beg for food. If we're righteous, we keep Shabbat, we keep kosher. No one says that we have to be the Gdol Adol. But doing the basics of Judaism... Learn some Torah every day, keep the basics of the mitzvot, and little by little, gradually go up. You don't have to, you don't, no one starts as the Gedol Adol. You know, remember, the people that were the most righteous in history weren't the most righteous from day one. They had to start somewhere. Little by little, they start. You know, Abiy Akiva is the famous and most important tshuva story in history, not because of how high he got to, but because of how low he started. He started at the age of 40. He didn't know how to read. He didn't know how to write. He was divorced with a son and he was poor. It doesn't get worse than that. He had to go to kindergarten. Oh, and I forgot. He also hated Jews, religious Jews. Even though his parents were converts and he was Jewish, he actually hated religious Jews. He was anti-Judaism. At 40 years old, he was anti-Judaism, poor, divorced with a kid, Illiterate. 24 years became the most important rabbi in history. Came to Yerushalayim with 24,000 students, which right now in the uh, 49 days of the Omer, were mourning for them. During this time, all of them died because they did not have enough respect in their level and love in their level for each other. And uh, we actually talked about this last week, but in case you guys didn't watch the shiur from last week... Um, what they mean is not respect like we think respect and love like we think love. What they mean is that when one of them was trying to do a mitzvah, doing a mitzvah, these are the biggest tanaim, these are the biggest sages in history. So they're trying to perfect every mitzvah. They're trying to be perfect. They're trying to be the most righteous in history because they love Hashem that much. So he's trying to do a mitzvah. And the other guy sees that he's, he could technically do it a little better. He knows there's a way that you could do this specific mitzvah a little bit better. But he said, you know what, he's doing good enough. I'm not going to rebuke him. I'm not, he, he's not going to rebuke him. He's not going to tell him, listen, you could do this a little better. For that is what the punishment was for. For us, it's not even a sin. For us, our problem is... That no one wants to rebuke anyone for anything. We see our friends violating Shabbat, we don't say nothing. We see people driving to shul, we don't say nothing. 
We see people eating uh, non-kosher. We don't say nothing. For that, look at the world around you. That's why we're suffering. Our obligation, ocheach, tocheach, etamitecha. We have to rebuke each other, not in a hateful way, not in an abusive way, but in a loving way to show each other that there is more to life than just this life. We're supposed to tell each other what to do, not because we're trying to make ourselves better than the other guy, but because we know, listen, buddy, there's going to come a day that you're going to go to Shemaim, and you have to, you have to pay the bill. What you're doing right now, you're going to have a pretty big bill. If we don't tell him, he doesn't know. When we go to Shemaim, they're going to say, okay, how come you didn't uh, keep Shabbat? He goes, oh, I don't know. Yeah, but your friend knew. Which friend? Joey, he, he knew. Yo- Yosef knew. Oh, yeah, I hung out with him every day. He never told me. Oh, bring him up too. They bring you up. Yosef, you knew? Yeah, I knew. You didn't tell him? No, why didn't you tell him? Ah, you know, I didn't want to bother him. What do you mean you don't want to bother him? He's going to be suffering for the next 5,000 years because of you. You want to bother him? No, I didn't want to disturb him. You know, he said... Live and let live. You live your life. I live my life. Okay, so he lived 70 years. Now what? Now he has to suffer because of you. Because you tell him. Who do you think gets a bigger punishment now? The one who didn't tell. Yosef. The Yosef who didn't tell, he's getting a bigger punishment. Why? Because he knew. The other one is accidental. He didn't know anything. He didn't know that Chilul Shabbat is the worst thing on earth. He didn't know. That's why in this world we have to wake up and realize that the tzaddikim that we're mourning for to this day, 2,000 years after it happened, uh, suffered and got punished for something small of not rebuking each other for minor things. We're not rebuking each other for big things. So it's just, just logic. You don't have to be a genius to realize this is not a good idea. That's why when we talk, when we have these lectures, I have a few purposes in life. One is to prove that Hashem exists to anyone. You, people watching it on YouTube, people we meet on the street, anyone who has a, 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 a uh, doubt of whether Hashem exists or not, I'm going to try to prove that He does. Either through my own knowledge or knowledge that I can give them for that other people have. It's, I think it's anyone that's intelligent should be relatively easy to convince that Hashem exists, not easy in the sense that it takes two seconds, but easy in the sense that it just requires time. The second thing is that once we know that Hashem exists, to prove that the Torah that He gave us is divine. It has to be from Him, and that means both the written Torah and the oral Torah. Once we know it's divine, we have to do something about it. A decision has to be made. You're either going to listen to it or not, but you can't say that, you don't, you're, uh, that it's not real. If you don't listen to it, it's on you. At least you know it's real. The third thing is to somehow convince some people to keep Shabbat, to keep the basics of the mitzvot. Because Kiyuv is one of the most important things that a Jew can do. Regardless, if you can speak, and Baruch Hashem, Hashem gave me the ability to speak. I've had a lot of training in the business world. And I think it's been training for this stuff. All this time, I'm thinking that I'm train- Hashem is training me to become a multi-billionaire. Little do I know that one day my, my life's focus is to do lectures about Kiyuv. So the key here is that you use Hashem's skills for things like that. There's more power to you. That's a real purpose in life. And, it's, 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 uh, and you guys coming to the shiur are part of that to benefit. Why? Because, you know, when people show up, it gives you even more, uh, you know, more schud. It gives you more uh, encouragement to continue. Third thing is to send people stuff. Anyone that doesn't want to come or anything like that, deliver the stuff on the internet, sending people CDs, sending people books, things like that. You, have, you know people that are far from Hashem. Give them a CD. Give them a book. Tell me their name. I'll send it to them. Because, again, we're running out of time. It's not like one of these things where... There's, uh, you know, if someone that believes in a Torah and knows the Torah will always agree with what the sages say and what the G'dolei Adol say. And there's not one giant sage in the world today or one giant sage that has lived in the past that can tell you that we have a lot of time based on the laws of the world. 
basically, what most uh, people agree to is that we're in a generation of the Mashiach. We will see it in our time, in our life. That's whether it happens tomorrow or in 10 years from now or 20 years from now, we don't know. But none of us know how long we're going to live in this world. Anyone that thinks that, hey, listen, I'm only 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old. Ah, Shem Elchem, I'll do tshuva one day. What if you die tomorrow? Chas v'chalida, but in reality, what if, what if we go up to Shemaim and say, okay, hey, hey, Hashem, how are you? You keep Shabbat? No. Why not? I thought I'm going to have another 10 years. Okay, now you didn't. Now what? You're cooked. Yes. <laughs> you know, so, again... No one lives their life with an expectation to die. No one lives their life with a thought, oh, you know what, maybe today is the day. I'm so excited. No, no one lives like that. But the key is to think in a positive way and use our time effectively. We know that Hashem gave us a love letter called the Torah, tells us how to live, how to be happy, how to succeed in everything. If we follow it, we're, we're, we're going to win in so many different ways in this world and the next world. The people that don't follow it, we have constant examples of what happens to them. We, it's not, there's no room for error. One of the things that we learned in this parasha, which we learned very little about this parasha during the but I think we learned a lot of things that are relevant, is in regards to the machalat sarat, these, this spiritual disease that people got they got mostly, most common was for slander, for talking bad about each other. Talking about, about, e about each other is much worse than most people give credit for. And the reason why is because talking bad about each other sometimes doesn't require words. How so? If, let's say, one of you says to me, listen, what do you think of so-and-so? Should I uh, invest with him? Or should I buy a house through him? Or should I use him as a mechanic? And I don't say anything, but I say, I make one of those facial remarks I call Hamut's face, you know, sour face. You're going to get the hint that I'm not a big fan. So you're not going to do it. You're not going to go send your car to fix it over there. And somebody's going to ask you, what do you think of so-and-so, same guy? And you're going to do the same thing. The next guy is going to do the same thing. A few months later, the guy's broke. He's bankrupt. Shut business. down the business. He's out of business. He can no longer afford to send his kids to his yeshiva. His kids go to public school. The kids start ma intermarrying. Their kids are completely goyim. And the entire future of that family is destroyed because I, Chas Halila, made a sour face. So tzarat is the least of my problems. It's very important that people understand that every action that we take in this world has consequences. And we have to think about those things ahead of time. You don't like somebody? Fine. You don't have to like them. But saying something bad about them? There's no need. The best thing to do if you don't like the guy? To be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if he's a good or bad. I don't know. Check him out. Check somebody out. Let's Google somebody. I don't know. It's okay to say I don't know. It's better to say I don't know and not be helpful than to destroy somebody's life, which is very, very highly recommended to never get into the journalism business. People that like to write, and they write stories about other people in the newspapers, they're destroying lives on a daily basis. They get 25 words from people. This one said this, this one said this, this one said this, this one said this. They combine it into a story. They publish it. The guy's life is destroyed. And a week later, we find out the whole, the whole story is fake. It's, there's a mistake. So the journalist says, oh, I'm sorry. You know, it's happened countless times every year. We're sorry we made a mistake. Yeah, by then, the guy's wife divorced him. He found out that someone's this. He lost his contracts. Nike's not going to call him back to redo the contract. His life is destroyed in a week. You're sorry he's not going to do anything for him. In those days, 3,300 years ago, because Am Yisrael saw so many miracles, Tzarat was actually one of the miracles. Even though it was a bad thing, it was actually a miracle. 
Why? Because instead of letting the outcome of your actions get so, so bad, he gave you the punishment right there and then, reminding you what you did and not allowing you to heal until you did tshuva. So he didn't let you see the outcome of the story for 20 years or 30 years and see the life of the people that you talked bad about destroyed and the kids becoming completely off the derech. No, you did something, you got punished. And you tried to fix it, but you don't know what you're fixing. So you continued fixing everything you can until you finally figured out what it was. And this tzarad was not only painful physically, not only did you have physical signs on you, but you also kicked out of the uh, out of the camp. You had to live outside of the camp. You're banned. It's not a good feeling. Why did Hashem make this specific uh, addition to this punishment? Okay, you're already suffering. You already have pain. You already have physical pain. You already look ugly. Why throw you out? Why let, let me live in the house? Leave me alone. Let me just sit in bed. No. Why do you talk bad about somebody? What are you causing? You're causing people. To revolt them. You're causing people to not like them. So when people don't like somebody, what do they do? They don't want to hang out with them. They don't want to spend time with them. They run away from them. So you're causing people to run away from them. I'm going to cause people, measure for measure, to run away from you. Every time someone comes close to you, what do you have to say? Contaminated. Tame. You have to say out loud. Tame, tame, don't come close to me. Somebody comes close to you, they get infected. The disease was so bad that one of the ways to notice it that the disease started on the walls. Cures. On the walls of the houses. You would start seeing signs on the walls. On the walls, on the clothing. And there's no way to heal it other than tshuva. No way to heal it. Still exists today, unfortunately. But uh, maybe, maybe it would be a good thing if it existed on a lot larger scale. People would realize we have to do tshuva. But the key here is that once somebody did tshuva, everyone did, they would get honored because they would do tshuva, they would bring a koban, and everyone would know, okay, this one made a mistake. Everyone knows he made a mistake because he got kicked out, he looks funny, he lost money, he lost this, he lost a lot of things during this punishment, but now he did tshuva. And we know that the tshuva, the, the healing could only happen through a real tshuva because Hashem knows what's in your heart. So a lot of people say, listen, I'm not uh, religious, but I'm religious in my heart. I believe in God in my heart. I don't keep Shabbat. I don't keep kosher, but I believe in God. Trust me, I have a munah. Me and Hashem, we're like this. That's what people say, especially Israelis. No, I need the tiba live. I'm religious in my heart. Unfortunately, Hashem really knows what's in your heart. Okay, live okay. And he knows you're not religious in your heart. Why? How does someone show their wife that they love her? So, no need for you guys to respond. I'll give you the answer. It's not a trick question. If someone has a wife, and every morning says, Honey, I love you. Ta! Slaps her in the face. You think she thinks he loves her? No, right? But if he says, Honey, I love you, and he gives her a hug, we're closer. He says nice things, he gives her compliments, he does things for her. I'm not talking about buying stuff, I'm talking about doing nice things, gestures, talks to her, spends time with her, gives her compliments, boosts our, e our, our, our ego, our, our, uh, our self esteem. Supports her in anything that she has. Listens. Someone wants a marriage to work. You have to listen. Someone wants a marriage to work. You have to become one. Hashem said that he created each soul. But the soul was separated. Where man comes together with a woman. They become a unified soul. They become a single soul. That's why a man is supposed to love his wife. More than anyone else, more than his kids, more than his parents, more than the father, more than the mother, more than the friends, more than anything else. The woman is considered as if it is himself. So it's not like an option. Listen, I like my wife, but I like my friends better. 
I like my wife, but you know, I, Torah says, respect uh, your parents. It's the uh, fifth commandment. Yes, but you have to like yourself first. And your wife is considered as if it's yourself. Your wife is considered as if it's you. So there's no, it comes before the parents. It comes before the friends. It comes before everybody. Someone wants to make their wife happy. Someone wants to make, he has to listen, he has to support her, he has to be a, a best friend. That's how a relationship works. If you're not best friends, then what's the point? If you don't like each other, how are you going to love each other? First you have to like each other as people. Then it comes love. But if every time she, says, she calls you while you're at work, and, oh, again, if you're one of those people, there's a problem. If you don't want to spend time with your wife doing nothing, there's a problem. You have to be able to get along like friends. Just like when you go out with your friends to a bar or to, I don't know, Shio Torah maybe or something, and you're having a good time with your friends, you should be able to do the same thing with your wife. That's how you know a relationship is going to work. If you can't spend time alone with your wife, then you have to work on your marriage. More important than anything else. It's actually part of the mitzvah of the Torah. So when someone loves their wife and he does all those things, we know he loves his wife. So you can't tell her, listen, I love you, but I need to slap you once in a while. That's not love. I love you, but I really don't want to talk to you ever. That's not love. So Hashem says the same thing. Saying that you love me in your heart, saying that you believe in me in your heart, means nothing to me. What are you doing for me? To show me the love. Oh, you keep my Shabbat? Okay, I see you love me. Oh, you keep kosher? I see you love me. Oh, you do tefillin, you pray to me every day. Oh, I, now I know you love me. Because you're doing something for me. But if every day you say, Oh, Hashem, by the way, I love you while you're eating a pig sandwich. That's not love. Every day you were saying, Oh, Hashem, no, I believe. I believe in Hashem. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I read uh, Tehillim three months ago. And uh, <laughs> I always kick, kiss the mezuzah. And when I go to Beknesset during the once a year on Yom Kippur, I kiss the Sefer Torah. I love Hashem, no? No, it's not loving Hashem. The Torah, if the Torah can speak to that person... It says, stop kissing me. Just start listening to me. So Hashem says, if you love me, do something. Do something about it, just like the wife is saying. And over here, Ta'am Yisraeli is telling us, he's not going to give them the opportunity to let the outcome of their sin get so bad. In some ways, we wish this was still happening today. But it got the nation... And we'll finish it up with this to a certain point. There's also the issues of Nida, which we talked a little bit about. But it got to a point which was very, very critical and alvaya leno that this, uh, this would actually happen. The, uh, during the parasha, it tells us that sometimes there would be a disease that wasn't tzarat that people would get. But they would think it's tzarat. And they would go to the Kohen, because the Kohen was the only one that was allowed to look at this. And they would go to the Kohen, like, yeah, is this tzarat? So Chazal is asking, why is Hashem mentioning this? Okay, so we know it's not tzarat. Right now we're talking about tzarat. Right now we're talking about the problem. Why is he mentioning in case it was something else? Okay, it's not. They made a mistake. Why? Well, he's going to mention every mistake they made. You know, they thought they were picking up a dollar, but it ended up being just a piece of paper. He's going to tell us about that too. No, you know, something, why, why isn't he mentioning this? Because Hashem's goal was to bring the nation to a point where they realize anything bad that happens in a person's life, they have to start thinking about their life. Meaning, they have to start thinking about what am I doing? Do I deserve this? What did I do to deserve this? Because even if someone reaches into their pocket, instead of, they're thinking they're going to get $10 out of their pocket, but instead only $1 comes out. They picked the wrong bill. Or in the Gemara, they talk about how they picked the wrong coin. They think that they're going to take out a quarter, but they took out a dime. That is actually a form of suffering. It's not big deal suffering, but it's, uh, it's suffering, it's considered. Someone shouldn't say the... Uh, uh, the uh, verse from Tehilim, Rein Aiva Amali, Vesal Chochatotai, 
you know, where people, as, you know, the, David Melech says, look at me, I only made just a few sins, but all my enemies are surrounding me. We don't need to get to that point, it's only a coin, not a big deal, but that is still a form of suffering. Baal Hashem is explained to us in his parasha, that any form of suffering that we get, we have to question our actions, and what did we do to deserve this, because Hashem, it Barach, is talking to us. He's giving us a message. Son, either this tikkun that you got is me showing you love, because I want to raise you and make you better, and the only way we become better is through struggle and effort, or it's a punishment, because you did something wrong, and I need you to know that you did something wrong before it gets too bad. You spilled the... You, you left the bottle open, and there's water coming out. Before all of the water for all of the town comes out, I'm reminding you to close. To close the bottle. So he's reminding us. So it's either the, the things that are happening in our life are either happening because Hashem is trying to raise us and get us to a higher level. So it's actually a form of love. Even a, something taking out the wrong coin could potentially be a form of love that Hashem is showing us because He says, listen, I want him to suffer just a little bit today, so in Olam Abba, He has that much more pleasure. So He doesn't have to suffer in the other bad place at all because He suffered just by taking out the wrong coin. He doesn't have any time at all in the bad place. He's only going to be in Gan Eden all the time because He paid His bill in this world already. So that little suffering that I gave Him where He lost some money, he, uh, little things like that, no big deal. Gan Eden, 100%. Or, before this sin that he just did, me he doesn't realize that he did, gets him to spend a life sentence in Gainom, I'm going to remind him before it gets too bad. Do tshuva, son. Do tshuva. And this, we'll finish it with a story that I think is very important. The Kohen would look at the people... And would test them for tzarat. How would he test them? He would look at their hairs. One of the signs of tzarat is that people would, would grow, they would have either a bald spot and they would grow these uh, uh, light hairs. They were like blonde hairs. Very, very small blonde hairs in that spot. And the Kohen would look at these hairs to see if the person has tzarat, he would have these hairs. If he didn't have tzarat, then he wouldn't have these hairs. It would just be some other disease. So one time there was a Kohen that told his wife, listen, I, uh, I'm going to leave town because I need to go to another town and uh, make some extra money. She goes, okay, what about your business? You know, people are having tzarat, you need to check. He goes, no, I'm going to teach you how to do it. Okay, what do I need to do? She goes, look at the hairs. She goes, what am I looking for? He goes, oh, you're looking for blonde hairs. And you have to make sure that the hairs, there's no two hairs coming out of the same hole. What's the big deal if two hairs come out of the same hole? Oh, if two hairs come out of the same hole, it's a big deal. If two hairs come out of the same hole, the person goes blind instantly. What do you mean it goes blind? Why would he go blind instantly? Because that's the way Hashem. Hashem said that every hair has to have its own hole. Why? She goes, because every time someone sweats, it's feeding that hair. So she says, your ears should listen to your foolish mouth. He says, what I say? You're saying that Hashem worried enough that every hair will have its own sweat, which is its own panasa. That if he ever shares his panasa with someone else, big damage happens. But you need to go to a different land to go make panasa. If Hashem cares about your hair to make panasa, you don't think he's going to care about you to make panasa over here when you're trying to do his mitzvot? This will teach us a little bit about Hashem. We always think we need to go here, we need to go there, we need to do all these things that we need to do to go make panasa. Panasa is from Shemaim, people. It's from Shemaim. You don't need to work 20 hours a day. You don't need to work 18 hours a day. You just need to work some basic hours, make a best effort, learn some Torah, do some mitzvot, everything's going to come. Whatever Hashem wants to give you, you're going to get. Whether you work 20 hours or you work 5 hours, you're going to get the same. If you believe in a Torah, that's what you have to somehow get yourself to believe. 
And this is something that we learned from a Kawain from this parasha. Bezat Hashem, all of this stuff helps us do more mitzvot, gets closer to Hashem, and Bezat Hashem continue getting closer and closer and helping others get closer. Amen. 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 Amen.